Αγαπητοί φίλοι και συνάδελφοι, έχουμε τη μεγάλη χαρά σήμερα να έχουμε μαζί μας τον καθηγητή Κωνσταντίνο Σοφοκλέους, ε, ο οποίος είναι στη Νέα Υόρκη και διαπρέπει, κάνοντάς μας όλους ιδιαίτερα περήφανους, τόσο τους Έλληνες όσο και τους Κύπριους. Ε, εργάζεται στο Πανεπιστήμιο του Ουέλ Κορνέλ, στην Ιατρική Σχολή και το αντίστοιχο νοσοκομείο είναι το Sloan Gathering Memorial Cancer Center, το γνωστό σε όλους αντικαρκυνικό το Memorial που λέμε στην Ελλάδα, στο οποίο ασχολείται ιδιαίτερα με τη μεταστατική νόσο του ύπατος και όχι μόνο. Ο καθηγητής Σοφοκλέβης μας έδωσε και πέρυσι live μια εξαιρετική ομιλία στη Θεσσαλονίκη πάνω στο θέμα αυτό και είπαμε φέτος ή δεν μπορούσε να ξαναέρθει τόσο σύντομα, να τον ακούσουμε και να τον μαγνητοσκοπήσουμε αυτή τη φορά για να τον έχουμε στην ηλεκτρονική βιβλιοθήκη του εργαστηρίου μας πάνω στις θεραπείες της επεμβατικής ογκολογίας για τις κολορέκταλ μεταστάσεις, το είπα. Κωνσταντίνε, παρακαλώ, ο λόγος είναι σε Ευχαριστώ πολύ, Αδάμ. Μεγάλη μου τιμή και ευχαρίστησή μου να είμαι μαζί σας. Είμαστε όλοι λυπημένοι και από τα τραγικά συμβάντα στα Τέμπη. Εύχομαι αυτό να είναι αφορμή να βελτιωθούν κάποια χρόνια προβλήματα στη χώρα. Να ρωτήσω λίγο πόσοι μας παρακολουθούν και ξέρουμε το επίπεδο ή όχι. Ε, το επίπεδο είναι συνήθω από ειδικευόμενου και ειδικού. Ωραία. Άρα δεν έχουμε φοιτητέ εδώ. Φοιτητέ όχι. Ωραία. Έγινε. Μία παρατήρηση, οι Κύπροι είναι Έλληνες, Αδάμ, να μην το ξεχνάμε. Εννοείται. Μιλάνε ελληνικά, Άρα, επειδή είπες... Οι Ελλαδίτες, οι Ελλαδίτες. Οι Ελλαδίτες και οι Έλληνες της Κύπρου, για να είμαστε πιο σαφείς. Οι λοιπόν, έτσι μπράβο. Λοιπόν, θα αρχίσουμε τώρα και θα γυρίσω αγγλικά για λόγους χρόνου, επειδή τα έχω γραμμένα στα αγγλικά και έχουμε μόνο 35 λεπτά. Θα τα πω στα αγγλικά. Αν δεν καταλαβαίνετε κάτι, ρωτάτε. Okay. Okay. All right, so we're going to talk about interventional oncology. Um, what are the therapies we can offer for colorectal cancer liver metastasis? Uh, just to give full disclosure, I do have res uh, support yes. from... You Can you hear me well? Yes. This okay. Is... So uh, just for full disclosure, I do have uh, industrial support for research, and I have served as a mm -hmm. consultant or an advisory board for uh, companies that manufacture either uh, ablation devices, uh, yttrium-90 devices, as well as software, uh, which will be mentioned during this talk. Um, topics that we're going to discuss uh, today specifically, we're going to go over potentially curative therapies that we have in interventional oncology. This include ablation and yttrium-90 Uh, radiation segmentectomy approach, which is a new concept. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the management of oligometastatic disease and colorectal uh, disease. And finally, we will discuss the role of uh, uh, intraarterial therapies and in particular yttrium-90 in the setting of chemorefractory uh, colorectal liver metastasis in the salvage setting. Now, first, let's start a little bit with the disease. When we're talking about colorectal liver metastasis, it's very important to know that not all liver metastases are equal. You may have a patient with infiltrative, uh, however, localized disease in the right lobe like here, and then you can have patients that have limited disease such as this, and even better peripherally small tumors, uh, as you can see here in this posterior sector. In a case like this, obviously the only curative intent treatment remains hepatectomy, and their interventional oncology can help either with the application of portal vein embolization if needed for contralateral hypertrophy, or with a new concept that is evolving, which is now called um, Uh, lobectomy with Y90 that not only causes um, hypertrophy of the non-involved liver, but also provides for control of the disease, uh, and it allows hypertrophy over a longer period of time, indicated for borderline uh, resectable tumors. In patients like this, however, where we have a relatively small peripheral tumor, one can consider Uh, ablation, and in particular thermal ablation, instead of surgery with 
uh, the intention to provide local cure. Finally, we have patients with advanced multifocal disease where chemotherapy remains the mainstay of treatment. However, the addition of intraarterial therapy, such as the BIRI, drug eluting beads with irinotecan or yttrium 90 can provide uh, additional control in the liver with the hope to prolong disease-free interval at least and hopefully even survival, although that has been shown only in limited trials. Now let's start uh, with the ablation for colorectal liver metastasis. Uh, it is well accepted by all specialties that uh, thermal ablation or any ablation is indicated in non-surgical candidates, uh, as well as those with recurrences after hepatectomy, provided that we're talking about patients with limited number of relatively small tumors. The ideal candidate is obviously a patient with a solitary tumor under three centimeters. And in surgical candidates with small volume disease that can be ablated with margins, one can consider ablation instead of surgery as the first go-to local therapy with the concept of the test of time that we will uh, discuss a little bit uh, further uh, down the road. Now, if you're going to give ablation, uh, especially in a patient with uh, potentially curative disease, it's very important to know uh, the clinical factors that can impact outcomes. These factors here include a node positive primary tumor that gives one point of risk, disease-free interval for initial diagnosis to the development of liver metastasis under 12 months, more than one liver tumor at the time of resection, size of larger tumor over five, and CA level at presentation over 200 nanograms per ml. This is the surgical clinical risk score that has been associated with outcomes after resection. We were able to modify this clinical risk score for ablation by changing the tumor size to three, the CA level from 200 to 30, and you can see that both progression-free survival and overall survival when stratified by the level of risk using these risk factors uh, correlates with the surgical outcomes and patients with low risk are better controlled and live longer after uh, thermal ablation. And this cohort uh, was, as you can see here, in 162 patients, 233 tumors treated with radiofrequency uh, ablation. Uh, this is actually an important point, and if any one of you is trying to pass the USMLE, it's one of the questions that you may see uh, that is getting in the boards, certainly it's getting in the boards for interventional radiology um, uh, certification. This is a paper from uh, the uh, group of Gigi Solbiadi in Milan, Italy. It, it's probably still one of the only papers that reported 10-year outcome after ablation with 18% of patients alive after ablation of node small uh, tumors uh, where um, control much better than larger tumors with the local tumor progression in the entire cohort being under 12%. Both uh, their study as well as ours has shown that survival is better for patients that have no recurrence or other metastasis, of course. But for those that do have recurrence, retreatment can make survival similar to those uh, that do not have recurrence or other metastasis. Therefore, retreatment for recurrence is indicated. When it comes to the space of ablation, this trial from Amsterdam, it's a very well-known trial, the CLOCK trial. It's actually a level one evidence. It's a randomized controlled trial of radiofrequency ablation in addition to oxaliplatin place chemotherapy in patients that were in initially non-resectable. And you can see when these patients were followed all the way to eight years post-treatment, the uh, ablation group uh, lived much longer. You can see here 36% versus 9% when compared to the chemotherapy only arm of the trial, proving that the addition of ablation actually provides for a longer survival. This trial compared the CLOCK trial that I just mentioned with the EPOC trial, a very similar trial uh, designed for hepatectomy, 
And when we compare tumors on both trials that were under uh, 4CM uh, uh, in both arms, you can see that the recurrence rates are very similar between resection and RFA. And for tumors under 3CM, you can see that the recurrence of RFA is only uh, 3%. Now, this study here evaluated radio frequency to the microwave technique. Uh, there is a lot of people that think that microwave is better than radio frequency. So actually here, we evaluated these two modalities uh, looking at the data with the ability to create a uh, margin and the proximity of a vessel to the tumor that is treated. As you can see here, for radio frequency ablation, the proximity to a vessel impacted outcomes. So if the tumor was near a vessel, you can see that the local tumor progression-free survival was lower than those tumors that were far away from the vessel. Uh, this same thing uh, was evaluated for microwave, and you can see the kaplan major curves crossing, which means that the perivascular location did not impact uh, the outcomes uh, of microwave ablation, and thus microwave ablation has the potential of treating equally perivascular tumors, unlike radiofrequency. If we go, however, and stratify the um, tumors that were treated with the ability to create a margin, we can see that regardless of the uh, modality that we used, a margin of 10 millimeters or more uh, was associated with absolute local tumor control and no recurrences, unlike uh, those tumors that could not be ablated with margins. And this uh, did not have any difference between the RF and the microwave groups, showing that really the endpoint should be the creation of a margin. This have been shown in many series from us and other institutions repetitively. And I think it's safe to say that if we have a margin between five to 10 millimeters, recurrences can be around 15 to 26%. And if the margin is indeed over 10 millimeters, uh, one can expect uh, local tumor progression or recurrences to be under 5%. Having said that, there are some patients that are at higher risk for complications, especially if you are more aggressive with margins. And this was something we find out uh, uh, in this uh, study is now published. I'm showing here, here it says in press, but this is actually published in 2020 in the clinical colorectal cancer, where essentially we showed that for patients that had previously treated uh, with intrahepatic chemotherapy with FUDR, prior exposure to avastin or bevacizumab, and pre-existing biliary dilatation, a margin over 10 millimeters, provided for an absolute tumor control. However, it had also a complications in the biliary system being around 21%. This dropped down to 4% when the margin was more conservative. So in this uh, population, uh, one may want to be a little a little less uh, aggressive and have other uh, additional steps to provide for complete uh, tumor eradication. One of those steps is the assessment of the ablation zone with a 3D uh, approach. There are several studies showing that the application of currently available platforms that can assess the tumor and the ablation zone and then fuse those results. They can identify areas of the tumor that are at risk uh, for recurrence, either because they were inappropriately treated or with insufficient margins. Here you can see the red representing residual tumor, the velvet representing a five millimeter margin and the blue uh, representing a 10 millimeter margin. Obviously this area is at risk for recurrence and the 3D measurement has a better discrimination and much better ability to detect that. This has been shown uh, from other investigators as well as this group from Austria, from Rido Bale, showing again that the minimal margin is the only independent predictor of local tumor progression. We showed the same with the uh, ablation confirmation software uh, here at Memorial. This is a software that is provided with the new wave ablation 
uh, microwave system. And you can see that sensitivity to detect a patient that would require was 93% uh, with uh, the software, much better than the 2D visual method with an atomic landmarks that we uh, originally described over 10 years ago. And we also showed that if we had this ability intraoperatively, we would offer ablation in 26 of 37 cases that actually recared within this cohort. Now, there are a lot of talk uh, whether SBRT can be used instead of ablation. Uh, you can see uh, studies supporting SBRT, like this study from Milan, Italy, indicating that SBRT uh, operates better than microwave uh, with uh, local progression-free survival at one year, 91% for SBRT versus 84% for microwave ablation. Uh, but again, you can see here that they only assess margins for the SBRT, no assessment of margins uh, for the microwave ablation. And this difference was only applied for tumors over 3CM, something that we know that thermal ablation uh, operates less effectively. Uh, and again, this uh, trial is really limited due to the uh, lack of data for tumors under 3CM and no stratification by margin between the two modalities. Exactly the opposite results from this uh, study from uh, the group of Martin Meyering in Amsterdam, the AMCOR registry, they reviewed their colorectal liver metastasis treated with thermal ablation, including microwave and RF versus SBRT. And you can see that the overall survival is better for ablation. And so is local tumor progression free survival. And then when they str stratify by tumor, this difference, of course, is much more prominent for tumors under 3CM. But uh, again, ablation has no difference for bigger tumors. Again, the limitation of this study, no stratification by margin, to be fair. So uh, for that reason, both of these studies are, are to be taken uh, uh, in consideration with a lot of reservations. We do know from uh, very early on, this is now 15-year-old publication, uh, that when we stratify outcomes by the ability to create a margin, you can see here local tumor progression and overall survival being identical between uh, colorectal liver metastasis treated with radiofrequency alone, radiofrequency and surgery, and surgery alone, no difference whatsoever as long as they can achieve a complete treatment without residual disease. Now, we do also know that even if we treat with good margins, recurrences or new metastases will occur in up to 50% of patients after any therapy, and that includes liver resection, hepatectomy. So the key question in this debate is which local treatment should be offered and when, because the chances are that if you are successful with each treatment, you will have to use all these treatments at some point over the course of the disease for each patient. We also know that perioperative complications influence recurrence and survival after resection of hepatic colorectal liver metastasis. And we do know that resection carries a morbidity of 33% and even a mortality of 2%. Therefore, is it reasonable to treat a tumor like this with resection? I would argue that with the higher complication and mortality rate and an overall survival for those that have a complication being dropped to 28 months instead of 75, this tumor would be better be treated by thermal ablation with the concept of a test of time that I have already mentioned. What is this concept? This concept is an ancient concept. This is 20 years old concept. Uh, maybe some of the audience has not been uh, alive when this paper was published, but the concept was that um, surgical uh, candidates will be treated with radiofrequency ablation at the time. And it was shown that in 53 out of 88, there was complete necrosis, complete ablation with margins, 98% of those were spared surgery, not because they were all successfully treated. 44% were successfully treated by ablation alone. Most importantly, 56% of this population developed 
multifocal progression of disease outside the liver metastasis within the next six months. And these patients will have received a necessary morbid uh, surgery, which will have no positive inc impact on their disease control and most importantly, survival. Now, if you are to offer local therapy, it is important to know that certain factors impact outcomes. One of them is the embryonic origin of primary tumors, similarly to the whole uh, natural history of this disease. Right-sided tumors fare better than left-sided tumors. As you can see here, they live longer, better control of the tumor. Those data were from MD Anderson in Texas, as well as uh, the Asian population. Similar results for KRAS mutation. Patients with KRAS mutations fare worse than KRAS wild types. This applies also to those that can be ablated with margins. You can see here in this cohort from MD Anderson, those that had a 10 millimeter margin, wild type, no recurrences, mutant patients, 17% recurrences, similar results from us, where you can see that wild type tumors can be well ablated and controlled, even with a margin that is not optimal. These are data for one to, to five millimeter margin, so suboptimal. If there is a suboptimal margin, the mutant tumors behave like those that they were not ablated at all or had a residual disease. So if you cannot achieve a nice margin on wild type tumors, you should not offer ablation at all. Now, there are certain strategies that we have developed over the years with the help of some NIH granting. This is a combination of real-time PET ablation combined with portal venous phase. It shows the ablation zone. It shows the tumor infusion in real time. That allows you to biopsy the area of the ablation zone where the tumor used to be, the minimal margin as perceived by imaging. And by this strategy, we know that a five millimeter margin, biopsy proven, no tumor left behind for radio frequency control 97% or more, two years or more from the ablation, very similar results with a combined larger group of microwave NRF with controls over 93% again sustained over two years. So for the high risk, uh, patients where you cannot go to 10 millimeter margins, a five millimeter uh, strategy with biopsy proven complete ablation, it's a very valid alternative and can provide for very effective uh, local tumor control. Based on these data, uh, as well as prior data, uh, the NCCN guidelines do recommend ablative techniques uh, that can be considered as a standalone treatment or in conjunction with resection, as long as all visible disease uh, can be eradicated by ablation or resection. Based on this data, this meta-analysis from uh, the group of Martin Meyering demonstrated that there was no difference between hepatectomy and microwave ablation specifically, and it raised uh, the point that right now, especially after the CLOCK trial, it is no longer acceptable not to offer ablation in patients that can be ablated with margins. This is not a question for a trial anymore. And the only question is whether thermal ablation can be offered instead of surgery. There is a trial open, the collision trial right now in the Netherlands that randomizes between resection and ablation uh, for relatively small tumors under three centimeters. And they have shown interim results uh, a year and a half ago in uh, CIRSET 2021, where they showed uh, no, non-inferiority of ablation compared to surgery for local progression-free survival per tumor and overall survival for the patients. And in addition to that, they showed better local progression-free survival for patients that were treated with ablation with the use of navigation and ablation zone assessment softwares. This takes us to this trial uh, that I have the honor to lead. It's a multi-center, uh, multinational trial that has just opened. It is sponsored by the Society of Interventional Oncology, 
and it offers microwave ablation of colorectal liver metastasis that need to be evaluated with a 3D confirmation software that must show uh, at least a minimal margin over five millimeters. Uh, this trial is open and enrolling. There is a site in Greece that is also going to be enrolling. If you have candidates, please consider enrolling them. Uh, that center is uh, in Athens um, uh, University um, a Center with uh, Professor uh, Kelekis and Philippiadis. Uh, that's one of the 10 sites, one of five in Europe that are enrolling. So to summarize, ablation for colorectal liver metastasis, ablation and resection with chemotherapy prolongs colorectal liver met, met uh, patient survival, repeated ablation uh, for progression or new metastasis prolongs survival without toxicity. For small tumors, ablation with clear margins can be offered ahead of surgery within the constant of test of time. Genetic factors and tumor biology impact outcomes and should be taken into consideration when customizing ablation. And of course, interventional oncology, clinical and imaging follow-up to detect recurrences and offer retreatment are of paramount importance. I will move on uh, to the use of Y90 in colorectal hepatic metastasis and review at least recent trials uh, and a little bit of background on this modality. But first, before we proceed in the last 15 minutes or so, why do we treat colorectal liver metastasis uh, that are diffuse and larger? So the reason is that the cancer, even in hypovascular METs, as you can see in this portal venous uh, CT, do have arterial supply, as you can see in the hepatic arterial phase of the same uh, patient, same CT. So you can target aggressively the artery, and because of the portal venous supply, the liver will not be impacted. In addition, local aggressive therapy minimizes systemic effects, and often the liver is the first and only site of disease. So by controlling the liver in this disease, you can expand uh, survival. Uh, this is a setup that we have here with hybrid rooms. You can see here how we deliver, uh, in this particular case, resin uh, microsphere. So the main topic of this uh, uh, last part of this lecture uh, is to review the evidence to see if it supports the use of Y90 for colon cancer liver metastasis, and if so, when and how should be applied. So let's review some data. This is early data. You can see here early 2000, this study here used Y90 resin microsphere through an hepatic arterial pump with concomitant FUDR, and it showed a median progression-free survival prolongation to 16 versus 10 months for the Synergy combination group. And this was the study that gave the FDA approval for resin microsphere back in early 2000. And that's how this treatment uh, was even approved for use. We're gonna review a relatively recent within the last five years trial, uh, uh, which here combines actually three randomized controlled trials that they were done in the same way to combine data. It was the FOXFIRE, the SURFLOX, and the FOXFIRE global trials. Together, pooling these trials accrued 1103 patients, and you can see they were randomized in FOLFOX chemotherapy with Y90, which was the study group, versus FOLFOX alone. And this is the way they were treated. Uh, the control arm receive Folfox uh, and uh, Bevacuzumab after Y90 plus Y90 with reduction of oxaliplatin uh, from 85 to 60, as you can see here. And um, these two groups were assessed not only for overall survival, but for several other uh, factors. You can see here the most impressive prolongation of liver disease control by eight months. However, despite this significant prolongation, when we see overall survival and uh, progression-free survival, there was no difference between the two arms. And this study, despite the better liver disease control, it was reported as a negative study. 
If we look a little deeper into the data, you can see that right-sided disease uh, patients in this same trial did have uh, a prolongation of median PFS, as you can see right here. And most importantly, they did have a five-month prolongation of median survival with a 36 protective effect against death when they received Y90 uh, resin microsphere in addition to oxaliplatin chemotherapy. How about toxicity? So when we see the data in terms of toxicity, there was no significant difference from standard of care chemotherapy. Radiation-induced liver disease was under 2%, and there was no non-target uh, non -target effects were, uh, were actually low, under 3%. Uh, Non-target effects uh, essentially refers to uh, gastrointestinal toxicity. Another important factor in this population is the ability to downsize uh, uh, disease uh, to resection. Uh, the original trial showed no difference. A meta-analysis looking at the data demonstrated that actually 38% of the Y90 group were resectable, where in the standard of care, only 28.9% would be resectable. And this uh, difference was uh, significant. We're going to move on to the chemorefractory and advanced disease uh, uh, treated with Y90, otherwise uh, known as the salvage setting Y90. The, here is where most of the Y90 is administered, at least uh, in the uh, United States and Europe. Early data from a phase three small trial from Belgium that demonstrated that in patients that fail, five of you, uh, they randomized patients with protracted FU versus protracted FU with Y90, and they noted a very, very strong signal, as you can see here, for time to liver progression, 5.5 versus 2.1 months, same to time to progression, prolonged with Y90, overall survival, prolonged but not significant, and this uh, is to be expected since there was crossover from the Y90 group to the chemotherapy, uh, to, sorry, from the chemotherapy group to the Y90 group upon progression. This is probably the most recent large randomized controlled trial. It was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology uh, in 2021, and essentially it combined glass microsphere with chemotherapy versus chemotherapy alone in the second line. So unlike Folfox, which was oxaliplatin, this trial allowed uh, treatment upon progression either for oxaliplatin or irinotecan. So it was a second line regimen and it demonstrated objective response rates of 34% for the uh, Y90 group versus 21. And more significantly, a 31 protection against progression and 41 protection against liver progression with prolongation of PFS and liver PFS for the Y90 group versus the chemotherapy alone group. Now, how safe it is to give it in a very advanced setting? And by very advanced setting, we mean beyond uh, third or subsequent lines of therapy. This is a study that we actually gave Y90 in patients that had progression after hepatic arterial chemotherapy. You can see here over 4.5 years of diagnosis, 3.9 years from diagnosis of liver metastasis progressing after hepatic arterial chemotherapy. This was a phase one trial that showed safety and actually an overall survival of 14.9 months since Y90, which was one of the longest survival noted in the salvage setting. We've also shown in a subsequent uh, uh, work that actually a response is much better assessed by incorporating metabolic imaging, PET, the persist criteria, much better to predict response than resist. This response actually correlates with survival and NCCN is now recommending, based on this data, PET in the assessment of Y90 uh, uh, in the standard of care assessment of the patient. Now, this is a multi-center uh, 
study by Andy Kennedy, one of the uh, uh, pioneers, Andy Kennedy, this radiation oncologist that does Y90 in the United States, uh, 606 patients treated with Y90 in, in 11 institutions. And you can see uh, that survival, again, is very similar uh, to prior uh, data around one year for advanced disease, and you can see a better survival if it's applied earlier in the course of the disease as one would expect. Similar outcomes from Euro Europe, this is in 979 patients from 20 centers in Europe. Again, median overall survival around 12 months uh, and low toxicities, as you can see. Repeated data, 530 patients, eight institutions. Difference in this uh, work is that it's glass uh, Y90 instead of resin. Median overall survival, 10.6 months. And a common denominator in all of these data is the factors that impact outcomes. You can see here ECOG status, uh, bilirubin levels, tumor burden, extra hepatic disease, uh, very, very important in determining outcomes. Here is a normogram that we were able uh, to, uh, uh, to describe in our cohort of 103 patients, of which 77% with extra hepatic disease. Uh, as you can see here, uh, very, very advanced disease, chemorefractory stage, uh, we assign points based on risk factor, tumor size, extra hepatic disease, CEA levels, albumin, ALT, differentiation of tumor. And you see here that when we combine points like that uh, uh, for each patient, um, we can see that those risk factors can impact the one year overall survival with low risk patients under 25 points, leaving 90% at one year and those that have high risk disease over 80 points, only 10% alive uh, at one year. So even in the same stage of disease from the same institution, you can see a great variability of outcome based on these known risk factors. To summarize the salvage setting survival, most of the trials again show survival around a year and uh, impacted uh, by the fact of uh, response or not. These are non-responders. These are responders. You can see responders living much longer than non-responders. Here is a study that I'm showing only for the purpose uh, for you to have in, in mind because it's a classical uh, poorly done study where it showed uh, that hepatic arterial infusion chemotherapy is better than Y90, but this is a classic study of lead time bias. You can see that uh, the overall survival from stage four diagnosis is actually identical between the pump and the Y90, no difference at all. So the reason they show this survival is because they actually started Y90 enrollment two years later than the enrollment for the pump. This is a classic study where there is what is called lead time bias, and you have to be careful uh, when seeing these studies on how to interpret them. So if we review the whole literature, does local regional therapy make sense in chemorefractory colorectal liver metastasis? In the natural history of disease, median survival is five months in this setting, and the available treatment TAS-102 and regorafenib give a survival benefit of six weeks over best supportive care. Intraarterial therapy is justified with survival over nine months consistently. You show the data, most of the people treated with Y90 live about a year, which is almost double than what the median survival is with best supportive care. Y90 is indicated in this setting, and this is why the NCCN guidelines recommend arterially directed catheter therapy, and in particular, yttrium-90 microsphere selective internal radiation as an option in highly selected patients with chemorefractory resistant disease and with predominant hepatic metastasis. We're going to close the lecture with some new concepts. We do know from HCC, especially from HCC, that optimal dosimetry has impacted outcomes with the concept of radiation segmentectomy, where ablative doses over 190 gray have been given to tumors, provide survival benefits, and histopathologically proven complete necrosis in a much higher uh, 
percentage, we can see here uh, the results of complete necrosis, 25 versus 67%. This is early results from radiation segmentectomy in HCC. Uh, recent outcomes uh, for colorectal liver metastasis have similarly shown that an absorbed tumor dose over 100 gray actually provides for a better survival. And that was for resin. Similarly, for glass, it has been shown that a higher dose uh, can better predict response, as you can see here with the area under the curve being much more sensitive as it approaches one. And what is this mar mar magic number? You can see here, uh, if the tumor has absorbed 139 gray or more, it predicts a three-month metabolic response, whereas if it has absorbed uh, uh, 180 nine gray or more, the prediction of response is 97% uh, specific and 45% uh, positive. So indeed, the tumor absorb uh, dose is uh, impacting outcomes. This leads us to the application of radiation segmentectomy for tumors that are relatively smaller. And for some reason, we don't want to give ablation like this tumor right here. It's so relatively larger than what we would like to see. It is, it's invading the portal venous branch. Uh, thermal ablation here will be difficult and will probably have an uh, immediate impact on the portal vein. And therefore, we have seen the growing role of uh, Y90 radiation segmentectomy for liver metastasis. There are three papers in this field. One of us, one of those is ours. You can see here. Uh, uh, the um, paper in Journal of Surgical Oncology with modified resist responses of 100%. Similarly for us, uh, response by Choi, 100%. Uh, again, resist is very suboptimal to assess response in this setting, 44%. Here, response 64 here. So I strongly encourage you. I know PET is not as um, easily accessible in Greece, but Certainly, if you have it, I, I strongly recommend that you use it. You can see here the response in the patient that I showed earlier, complete sustained response, complete necrosis, 20, 12 months after Y90. So in conclusion, Y90 prolonged survival in right-sided uh, colorectal liver metastasis, in particular in that population, in prolongs liver disease control at any stage of disease, even in the negative trial, it did that by eight months. It consistently offers overall survival benefit over best supportive care in chemorefractory colorectal liver metastasis. Toxicity is low and well tolerated. Y90 radiation segmentectomy is an emerging local curative therapy. It's alternative to ablative stereoactive body radiotherapy and thermal ablation. Y90 has no hospital admission. It has low impact on quality of life. And of course, improvement through uh, optimal dosimetry is critical, and that's where the research is directed right now. And with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and the invitation. Thank you very much. I think we have one or two minutes for a question, if you guys want. Thank you very much, Για αυτή την τρομερά εμπεριστατωμένη και αναλυτική παρουσίαση όλων των δυνατοτήτων που έχει αυτή τη στιγμή η επεμβατική ακτινολογία στη μεταστατική νόσο του ύπατο. Ε, θα μείνω στο τελευταίο κεφάλαιο που ανέπτυξε με το ραδιοεμβολισμό, επειδή σε σχέση με την περσινή του παρουσία σε εμά έχουμε καταφέρει να το ξεκινήσουμε. Έχουν κάνει ήδη τρία περιστατικά. Άλλο. Αισιοδοξούμε για το μέλλον. Ε, Βλέπουμε ότι πραγματικά διεθνώ υπάρχει μια, ας πούμε, μια τάση για αύξηση των ραδιοεμβολισμών σε σχέση με τους χημιαμβολισμούς. Ε, κάποιες από τις ανταδείξεις του χημιαμβολισμού δεν, δεν είναι ανταδείξεις για τον ραδιοεμβολισμό και είμαστε πιο αισιόδοξοι σε αρκετούς ασθενείς που του θεωρούμε λίγο ή πολύ ε, χαμένους, δεν θα έλεγα, αλλά πιο δύσκολε περιπτώσει. Ναι τόσο στα υπαδεκταρικά όσο και στις υπαρκές μεταστάσεις. Ε, ήθελα να κάνω μερικές ερωτήσεις και μετά να δω αν υπάρχει κάποια ερώτηση από το κοινό. 
Καταρχάς, αυτά όλα που λέγαμε τα περισσότερα είναι για τις κολορέκταλ μεταστάσεις. Όσο χειρότερα είναι τα πράγματα με άλλου τύπου μεταστάσεις ή αν έχουμε ανάστροφα, αν έχουμε κάποιες αισιόδοξε ενδείξει ότι και κάποιες άλλες πρωτοπαθείς βλάβες με υπατικές μεταστάσεις μπορούν να αντιμετωπιστούν επίσης καλά. Φυσικά εννοείται ότι το υπατοκυταρικό είναι πολύ μέσα στο standard of care τόσο με χημιοεμβολισμό όσο και με Y90. Όσον αφορά τις μεταστάσεις, εάν φύγουμε από το, τις μεταστάσεις του παχαίου εντέρου, άλλες νόσους τις οποίες υπάρχει τουλάχιστον ενδείξεις ότι ευνοούνται, όχι ακριβώς βεβαίως με το ίδιο σκεπτικό όπως το παχύ, είναι σίγουρα ο μαστός όπου εφαρμόζουμε τοπικές θεραπείες συμπεριλαμβανομένου του ραδιοεμβολισμού τόσο για να ελέγξουμε την νόσο στο ύπαρ, αλλά συχνά για να την ελέγξουμε έτσι ώστε να μην αναγκαστούν οι ασθενεί να πάνε σε χημιοτοξική θεραπεία. Δηλαδή είναι λίγο διαφορετική η νοοτροπία του πώς και γιατί το κάνουμε. Στις, στις μεταστάσεις του παχαίου εντέρου συνήθως στην προχωρημένη νόσο το κάνουμε σε συνδυασμό με χημιοθεραπεία, ακόμη και αν είναι επανάληψη του 5FU, για παράδειγμα. Στο μαστό, κυρίως αν έχουν ορμονοθεραπεία ή χαμηλή τοξίτητας θεραπεία, το κάνουμε ώστε να παραμείνουν στην ίδια και να παραταθεί η διάρκεια α, του ελέγχου της νόσου πριν να τους δώσουν πολύ τοξικές χημιοθεραπείες. Οπότε είναι λίγο διαφορετικό το σκεπτικό εκεί. Ε, σε προχωρημένη νόσο το κάνουμε επίσης, αλλά εκεί δεν είμαι σίγουρος σε ποιο βαθμό έχουμε βοηθήσει, κυρίως το, στην επιβίωση. Υπάρχουν ε, πάντω και εκεί αρκετά πια συγγράμματα, αρκετές δημοσιεύσεις που δείχνουν ότι ένας από τους πιο σημαντικούς παράγοντες είναι η απορροφούμενη δόση από τον όγκο. Και αυτό φαίνεται να είναι ο κοινός παρονομαστής. Αυτό που δεν ξέρουμε και που δεν μπορούμε και σίγουρα να εξάγουμε το συμπέρασμα από το επιτοκυταρικό είναι για παράδειγμα ότι σήμερα που στο επιτοκυταρικό μπορεί να δίνει τουλάχιστον για radiation segmentectomy 400 gray Μπορεί αυτό αμέσω να το μεταφράσει στι μεταστάσει. Οπότε εκεί έχουμε κάποιο κενό γνώση, στο οποίο χρειάζεται πιο πολλή δουλειά. Άλλε μεταστάσει που μπορούν να αντιμετωπιστούν με αυτό είναι φυσικά η νευροενδοκρινική όγκη. Αλλά εκεί θα, θα περίμενα να εφαρμόσω αυτή τη θεραπεία εάν αποτύχει η κλασική θεραπεία με εμβολισμό απλό ή με χήμιο εμβολισμό. Και ο λόγος που το λέω αυτό είναι γιατί ξέρουμε κυρίως τους νευροενδοκρινικούς ότι οι ασθενείς ζουν πάρα πολλά χρόνια και θα χρειαστούν πάρα πολλές επαναλαμβανόμενες θεραπείες. Το ίδιο ισχύει και για το επιτακυταρικό. Δηλαδή στη δικιά μας κλινική εδώ θα πάμε στον ράδιο στην πραγματικότητα όταν πλέον αποτύχουν από απλό εμβολισμό με, με σωματίδια ή με drug eluding beats ή χημιοεμβολισμό για το επιτοκυταρικό. Στο παχύ έντερο είναι λίγο διαφορετικά τα πράγματα, γιατί ε, κυρίως δεν ανταποκρίνονται στον απλό εμβολισμό και ε, γιατί τα περιστατικά που έχουμε δει με ειρηνοτήκαν είναι πάρα, πάρα πολύ λίγα για να πω ότι μπορούμε να βγάλουμε κάποιο συμπέρασμα και έχουν και τοξικό ε, μετά την επέμβαση ε, αγωγή όπου χρειάζεται να νοσηλευθούν, έχουν πόνο και ούτω καθεξής. Οπότε η ποιότητα ζωής είναι χειρότερη μετά από το drug eluding beats με ειρηνοτήκαν. Δεν ξέρω να σου απάντησα σε αυτό που ήθελες, αλλά... Ναι, ευχαριστώ, ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Αυτό βέβαια μου δημιουργεί μια άλλη απορία πώς να κάνουμε πρώτα με εμβολισμούς ή απλούς εμβολισμούς Yeah. Ε, ε, θα σου πω, εξαρτάται yeah. από τον όγκο. Οπότε, εάν έχεις έναν όγκο σε έναν ασθενή που ξέρεις ότι η πιθανότητα είναι να επανέλθει μέσα στον επόμενο χρόνο και είναι όγκος ο οποίος έχει καλή αρτηριακή αιμάτωση, δηλαδή είναι hypervascular, υπε, υπερ, έχει υπερεμάτωση, τότε θα προτιμούσα να μην χρησιμοποιήσω ραδιοεμβολισμό σαν πρώτο α, μέσο ελέγχου της νόσου. Θα πήγαινα είτε με απλό εμβολισμό με μικρά σωματίδια είτε με χημείο εμβολισμό ανάλογα με, πάλι ανάλογα με την παθολογία του όγκου. Ε, εάν είναι όμως όγκος ο οποίος δεν έχει αρκετή ε, 
αιμοδιήθηση, τότε σε αναγκάζει να χρησιμοποιήσεις ραδιοεμβολισμό που είναι πιο μικρό το, το σωματίδιο και πάει γύρω και κάνει την ακτινοβολία σε χρόνο και ούτω καθεξής. Οπότε σίγουρα αυτός είναι ένας παράγοντας, η αιμάτωση του όγκου. Και ο δεύτερος παράγοντας είναι πόσο είναι ο όγκος ακτινοευαίσθητος ή όχι. Αν έχεις ένα ακτινοευαίσθητο όγκο, τότε θα έχεις καλύτερη α, ανταπόκριση με αυτή τη θεραπεία από ότι ένας όγκος ο οποίος δεν είναι ακτινοευαίσθητος. Οπότε αυτοί οι παράγοντες έρχονται να παίξουν το ρόλο τους με βάση την παθολογία του συγκεκριμένου όγκου. Πολύ ωραία. Ε, άρα, ε, μικρότερες αγγείως όγκοι, όπως ας πούμε και το χολαγγιοκαρκίνωμα, ε, mm-hmm. ίσως να πηγαίναμε κατευθείαν στον ραδιοεμβολισμό πλέον. Α, ακριβώς. Εάν είναι σε θέση, α, ναι, ο, οπωσδήποτε, και, και σε σχέση με τον, με τον κανονικό εμβολισμό και τον χήμη εμβολισμό, οπωσδήποτε. Εκεί εξαρτάται από την τοποθεσία του όγκου, όπως ξέρεις, γιατί αν είναι σε πολύ κεντρικό θέμα, να κουμπάει το σηκώτι, το, το γαστρεντερικό και όλα αυτά, έχεις άλλους, άλλες, πώς να το πω, Είσαι παράγοντες. Ναι, ναι. ναι, ακριβώς, που, που θα σε επηρεάσουν. Αλλά αν μιλάμε πια για μεταστοτικό χολαγγιοκαρκίνωμα που έχει πάει και στους δύο λοβούς και έχεις μαλτιφόκαλ διζής, τότε ναι. Ε, αν είναι όγκος ε, με χαμηλή αιμοδιήθηση, τότε ναι, ε, ο ραδιοεμβολισμός ενδείκνεται ε, πριν κάνεις κάτι άλλο ε, σε αυτή την περίπτωση. Πολύ ωραία. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Έχουμε μια ερώτηση ε, από το κοινό. Μισό λεπτό να εστιάσω λίγο. Ωραία. Έχουμε εδώ τον κύριο Τέντε. Ο κύριο Τέντε είναι από του καλύτερου κοινοβουλευτέ στη χώρα. Ωραία, χαίρομαι. Και κάτσε να στον παρουσιάσω εδώ. Είναι εδώ στη γωνία. Κύριε Τέντε, παρακαλώ. Γεια σα. Γεια σα, γεια σα. Συγχαρητήρια, καθ' εσά. Ευχαριστώ πολύ γι' αυτό. Εγώ ευχαριστώ. Τι Στη μεταστατική νόσο στο Μάκο ή Κίστ ή στο... Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Πολύ καλή ερώτηση. Γενικότερα στις μεταστάσεις ισοφάγου, γαστρικού, παγκρέατος, α, οι επεμβάσεις οι τοπικές όπως και χειρουργική έχουν πολύ λίγο αποτέλεσμα γιατί αυτοί οι όγκοι όπως ξέρετε έχουν πολύ ψηλή κακοήθεια και υποτροπιάζουν πολύ συχνά. Αυτό που φαίνεται να ισχύει είναι ότι υπάρχουν συγκεκριμένοι γενετικοί δείκτες σε όλους αυτούς τους όγκους και αυτοί οι οποίοι έχουν χαμηλή ας το πούμε κακοήθεια και βλέπει κανείς ότι διατηρούν για παράδειγμα κάποιον όγκο στο σηκώτη ενώ δεν έχουν αναπτύξει σημαντικές εξωϊπαντικές βλάβες σε αυτούς μπορεί κανείς α, να, να θεωρήσει επιλεκτικά α, κάποια τοπική θεραπεία είτε αυτή είναι καυτηριασμός με βελόνα αν είναι μικρός όγκος και μπορείς να τον α, καταπολεμήσεις με, α, με αυτό και μόνο έχοντας τα όρια που θέλεις, τα margins που λέμε και επίσης με ενταρτηριακή θεραπεία και πάλι η αγκιοβρύθεια θα, θα μας πει αν είναι κάποιος που θα πάμε με εμβολισμό ή με κλασικό εμβολισμό. Αλλά το πιο σημαντικό από όλα είναι η βιολογία του όγκου και το λεγόμενο test of time εδώ όπου θα έβλεπα εάν ο όγκος πήγε στο σηκώτη τώρα δεν θα έκανα τη θεραπεία τώρα, θα έκανα τη συστηματική θεραπεία standard of care και αν για παράδειγμα 6, 7, 8 μήνες μετά Uh, το, το θέμα παραμένει μόνο στο σηκώτι και δεν έχει αναπτύξει ο ασθενής περιτονιακούς, uh, περιτονιακές διηθήσεις uh, ή, ή πάρα πολλές uh, εξωϊπαντικές μεταστάσεις, τότε ναι, θα, θα, θα συζητούσα uh, την αξία της τοπικής θεραπείας. Δεν υπάρχουν πάρα πολλά δημοσιευμένα uh, συγγράμματα σε αυτά uh, που να έχουν έρθει στην αντίληψή μου, αλλά σίγουρα uh, μεμονωμένα και μικρές σειρέ uh, υπάρχουν. Uh, με εξαίρεση ίσως το gastrointestinal stromal tumor που είναι λίγο διαφορετικό, εκεί έχουμε λίγο πιο πολύ δεδομένα και φαίνεται ότι σε αυτούς που διαφεύγουν uh, τη συστημική θεραπεία μπορούν να προσφέρουν με κάποια επιπρόσθετη, uh, κάποιον επιπρόσθετο έλεγχο με τοπικές θεραπείες στο ΙΠΑΡ. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ευχαριστώ και εγώ. Ε, υπάρχει κάποια άλλη ερώτηση από το κοινό. Ωραία. Αν όχι, να αλλάξουμε τον κύριο... Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Εμένα αρχίζει η κλινική μου. Εσάς τελειώνει. Ακριβώς. Επειδή είναι με πίεση χρόνου, το ευχαριστήσω Έγινε. πάρα πολύ. Να είστε καλά και ελπίζω Έτσι. να... Και να θα, ότι θα τα πούμε εύχομαι πολύ σύντομα και από κοντά. Να είστε καλά. Να περνάτε καλά. Για χαρά. Γεια σας.